A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, the wonderful uh, members of the IAEE community. And it gives me an absolute pleasure to be interviewing uh, Professor Yukari, who is the director of the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, and a board member as well of the IAEE uh, international community. And uh, we had the pleasure of her uh, hosting and chairing the last closing plenary session of the conference. And uh, uh, as as an ambassador following the conference, I have some uh, interesting questions uh, to discuss with the professor, which might be useful for those of you who missed out on uh, listening to this, uh, to this session in entirety. Uh, so, Professor, we had a very interesting lineup of speakers, and I think uh, it covered a very global perspective uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, my first question to you is, uh, it was very uh, encouraging uh, to see uh, countries such as India and China uh, forthcomingly coming forward and uh, developing their uh, strategy towards meeting the uh, climate goals that we have set forward uh, via the Paris Agreement and particularly having clear uh, direction towards the 2030 and 2050 uh, roadmap that's already laid for us. Uh, we saw uh, the Indian speaker uh, emphasizing some of the transition pillars such as energy efficiency, uh, renewable energies, of course, is a central theme. But they're also looking at uh, new emerging technologies such as electric vehicles and green hydrogen in the decarbonization pathways. Uh, on the uh, contrary, we also see China, which has a very clear focus on renewables, uh, both intermediate and also large scale in terms of uh, uh, hydro and uh, nuclear. But I think they also have a very clear focus on emphasizing their grids and not just focusing on the technologies, but they have a very clear uh, focus on how to enhance the grids so that they can use the system more efficiently and looking towards much more smarter pricing mechanisms to sort of uh, translate these benefits to the consumers. So uh, uh, my question to you is, uh, do you see that these ingredients that these countries are uh, working with is enough to meet uh, the climate targets or uh, would you have uh, some suggestions on what these countries could be doing going forward? Well, I was uh, um, presently impressed that the uh, India and China uh, clearly said uh, to in this session that they are uh, trying to meet the target and then they are on track. Um, the for for example, like India, I was so impressed. The few years ago, they were talking about the. Uh, uh, exhausting their resource, which is actually domestic coal, and now they don't talk about it. They are uh, very confident that they are going to supply electricity more cleanly with the renewable electricity uh, while uh, connecting everybody to the central centralized grid. But they also try to involve the uh, rural sector, like agriculture sector, into this system by uh, how to say the uh, providing uh, the financial uh, uh, the support uh, to fast track uh, those people who are uh, facing uh, higher higher or new investment uh, which are required. Uh, on the other hand, China is different a little bit in a way uh, in balancing their traditional uh, fossil fuels needs. Uh, they have a domestic. They have domestic coals. They have domestically available oil and gas, and then they they are not yet letting it go. But by 2030, 2035, uh, they are trying to pick pick uh, coal out, and then then uh, shift away from uh, uh, developing coal. But both countries, we thought, uh, are abundant with the domestic coal that they, we have to. Uh, try to help them out uh, with the new technologies uh, so that they, they can smoothly shift away from coal towards something new, uh, maybe a as a transition, the uh, natural gas and, and then renewable, but they are fast tracking all this and then that was very impressive. Uh, but of course, uh, later uh, you will ask me something about the uh, other panelists, uh, uh, the presentation. Uh, there are many challenges involved in the uh, in um, supplying or utilizing uh, renewable electricity. Um, so they are also aware of that. Uh, yes, Professor. Rightly uh, taking us to the next question, uh, which uh, Mr. Frank Wolock uh, did bring up uh, at the session. That is, uh, it's great. We're having a lot of renewable energy influx, and particularly uh, there is a larger share of intermediate renewable uh, energy that's a part of the uh, mix that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. 
but how do we uh, ensure the reliability of supply when we have a larger uh, uh, intermittent renewables as part of our system and how could we provide more uh, efficient solutions going forward because the uh, clearly there is no one and zero answer but we need to come up with a way uh, for us to efficiently move forward what are your thoughts on that yeah um it was very impressive the uh, frank's uh, presentation uh, really touched upon the latest issue uh, which world watched uh, which happened in texas and then he also mentioned the, that that is relevant to california these are the two states in the us uh, which are known for being very much advanced uh, in terms of uh, utilizing uh, uh, renewable electricity which is actually uh, variable electricity is intermittent ones uh, we were uh, envious of them that they, they are ahead of us, but at the same time, uh, we saw the hard way that if the demand unexpectedly uh, increased and and the weather doesn't allow uh, these intermittent uh, uh, renewables to supply enough to meet the uh, the demand, then the uh, utility system, which is under the wholesale market, uh, may face a serious uh, uh, challenge. And actually, that is exactly what happened in Japan. Therefore, uh, in Japanese people were watching very carefully what's going on in Texas. But it can happen uh, if we uh, once uh, become uh, dependent on the natural system, uh, the nature, uh, whether wind blows or where the sun uh, shines, uh, we have to have the backup system. And then they, we learned uh, that it is very difficult uh, where many players are suppliers of these electricities. We don't know ahead of time how much is actually very uh, rea rea reliable source uh, in the case of um, uh, sudden increase in demand, etc. Therefore, uh, I invite uh, everybody who is interested in such issue uh, to uh, look up uh, Frank's presentation, which had many references uh, along with his uh, theory. Thank you, Professor. And I think it's getting even more challenging as the microclimates emerge and uh, we were not able to more accurately predict how uh, temperatures and uh, weather change across the world. Uh, this takes me to the next question where uh, Professor Glechon uh, rightly brought out the importance of decision making among the various stakeholders. And he uh, laid out the four layers uh, that he uh, sees in the European Union. Particularly at the topmost layer, we have the European institutions that have set a collective mandate. Then we have the member states that have adopted that and have uh, taken forward this at, at a country level. Then we also have the energy utilities and uh, different uh, service providers and firms playing an active role and a proactive role even in, in the case of Europe. But a key question that he left uh, us um, thinking about is, are the citizens ready to, bird, uh, to bear these transitioning costs and uh, how much of the, uh, them, uh, their involvement can we expect uh, while we are ourselves experimenting with how the sector is moving forward? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, I gather that he was not that optimistic that the citizens will follow what the government uh, plan to do uh, and then they won't react as um, uh, regulated by the government or uh, even the companies who are pledged who have pledged uh, to go more um, how to say uh, less carbon in de carbon dependent uh, way of uh, uh, manufacturing or doing businesses. Um, on the other hand, uh, we talked a little bit about the influence or effect of the COVID-19, and then some pointed out that the, maybe uh, the behavior is changing uh, because of a restriction that we cannot move, move, uh, you know, uh, move along, or uh, we cannot travel, or we would like to refrain from uh, being in the public too long, etc. May change the way we uh, use uh, transport, or we refrain from uh, moving from one place to another, or um, maybe the uh, other ways of communication, like this one, uh, the electronically meeting, uh, is be will become popular that it may be uh, on the advantage side to reduce the uh, energy consumption but everybody kind of agreed that it is too early uh, 
to believe that uh, this will it this is it and then the um, uh, we can trust that uh, this will stay with us at the end of the day even though we are meeting online this time uh, we prefer to have the face-to-face -face meeting it's much more um how to say it is filled with more emotion uh, filled yes. with more happiness and and also the maybe information which is inherent in your facial expression etc therefore um it it is a complex uh, things that the we at the end of the day which comes down to the citizens or consumers or the laborers how they react and then i think this is a uh, the open-end question, and then the, we have to uh, keep exploring uh, how uh, people will uh, react or we, we will act on it. Definitely, Professor. I think uh, while we all uh, theorize a lot of different uh, solutions, I think you rightly pointed out that the human emotions and the human interactions are uh, far more valuable at times. And uh, I would have personally love to have this interview in person with you, but uh, <laughs> never mind. We are in a more efficient uh, uh, system and trying to work this out. But um, another uh, uh, aspect that uh, Professor Gleshaw did point out is for us to have a much more robust academic interlinkages. He brought about uh, 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 the concept of how we can reverse engineer and look for solutions while keeping in mind uh, some of the uh, economic domains of externalities, opportunity costs, behavioral economics, political economy and, uh, and studies on geopolitics in mind when we're developing the solutions. Do you see enough of this happening uh, currently? Um, I think we are on, on its way to um, explore uh, how we can address this. It is really cross-cutting issues. And then the, uh, if we address something here, and then there's something which is not very good, may be happening on the other way, uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, therefore, uh, in order to understand the uh, whole picture of the uh, the outcome of uh, one different uh, way of doing things, uh, we need to uh, how to say uh, to utilize all different kinds of these analytical tools in economics, uh, and then they uh, try to come up with the uh, uh, how do you call it the uh, best solution. Um, the climate change issue. Uh, affects everybody and in every uh, how to say types of our human activities. Therefore, it is very important that the, we don't actually focus only one side of the coin. Uh, we have to look on the other side of the coin. Um, I seem I have um, uh, lost most of your uh, uh, speeches because the connection was bad. But uh, I guess you are talking about the holistic approach under the uh, circular carbon economy, which Adam has uh, pointed out. Um, actually, yes. the Japan has been a big, huge supporter of this concept uh, because uh, we are suffering from the uh, no, almost no domestic uh, energy supply, while uh, nuclear is uh, kind of uh, having difficulties coming back in operation. Um, then, then we believe that for the short term, uh, the utilizing the uh, decarbonized fossil fuels is very important. And then the carbon circular economy involves that as a part of their tools. And yesterday's uh, Adam's um, uh, intervention was very, uh, very interesting to me that because he pointed out that, well, it is a holistic concept, uh, actually covers almost everything we already have. And then also, additionally, uh, he invites the uh, new technologies to be added on. Um, so uh, it is a, a way to uh, think more clearly. So where we, which part of this uh, circular carbon economy we are contributing with this specific policies or technologies or financial tool. And then, then uh, we can actually uh, utilize those tools from the toolbox and then the, uh, meet the 50, 2050 target. The toolbox is not yet full. Uh, it is our responsibility to add tools along the way. And then that is very interesting to understand um, how the concept will, uh, will uh, uh, cover uh, everybody's um, uh, different uh, interests of different from the different parts of the world. And yet, uh, if you look into the toolbox, uh, if you are looking for some new uh, methodology or new solution, it may be already available. Uh, of course, the new technologies are yet to be developed, and then that actually involves the uh, more collaboration and then the uh, um, 
in the in terms of uh, technological development and also financing for the distribution or dissemination of these technologies. Uh, uh, very well uh, put, Professor, in terms of the toolbox that we all can collectively put in to, and take out and use in our respective uh, parts of the world. Uh, so in, in conclusion, uh, what would be uh, your key uh, message to the audience? Uh, what's the key takeaway of this session? Well, um, what we have discussed um, relevant to all the countries in the world, even though we ran out of time that we didn't really exhaust the discussion about the collaboration, or uh, it's not only those countries who have uh, uh, declared that they will uh, meet the uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, it, it involves, it has to involve all the countries in the world globally to meet the target. So uh, that kind of collaboration and then it try to uh, let the uh, others meet other uh, sustainable, sustainable development goals is also very much part of this uh, uh, movement. Uh, we should not forget about it. And then, of course, uh, we have to involve the younger generations. Yeah, yesterday, I don't know how much was the average age of the participants, including myself, very, very high, <laughs> but uh, uh, the coming uh, decades are uh, in hands of uh, younger generations. So I hope uh, the younger uh, researchers who are the members of the IAEE or even non-members who are yet to become the member of the IAEE uh, will uh, have, uh, will, how to say, uh, join this um, um, analytical uh, uh, thinking and then they uh, try to act on uh, their way of think upon their way of thinking, and then they try to change the world uh, as fast as possible, so that we will meet uh, this target, which is uh, um, actually at the moment very ambitious and then very much difficult to meet. Uh, it is in the hands of youngsters uh, to be creative and then to make it happen. Thank you, Professor. I think. Uh... Uh, I think the old meets the new and in moving towards our new energy and climate landscape, I think the call to action from you is very clear. Uh, while we are developing the toolbox, uh, a very important aspect is uh, to engage the youth and I think uh, more uh, researchers and uh, active practitioners from the sector should come forward and play a much more proactive role uh, learning from uh, all the experiences that uh, the likes of you have uh, made so far. I think uh, that that's a wonderful message uh, for the conference uh, uh, in general and hopefully by the next uh, conference our participation of the youth at the conference itself uh, should be increased i think uh, that could be a message uh, to the iae uh, bodies across the world as well uh, thank you so much professor for joining me in this discussion uh, and uh, i hope our audience enjoyed this and if you would like to ask and uh, further questions you can definitely feel free to engage with uh, professor yukari and also the other panelists of the session uh, this is shweta bag with signing off from the iae 2021 online conference and see you around next time thank you very much and then welcome to tokyo next year <laughs>